All right, guys, you know what today is? Today is, um, I did miss yesterday. Uh, we had a lot, to, it was a lot going on yesterday, believe it or not. Just in case you did not know. Yeah, I know you guys been watching certain events take place between China and North Korea and Russia, right? And if you notice, Kim Jong-un and his inspection of military bases, well, those are pre-war inspections. You won't hear it that way, but that's the way it is, pre-war inspections. That means you're in that season where we are seeing the onset, I'm going to go ahead and say it, of World War III. You're seeing that, okay? I hope that you guys are prepped for that, which is, in, in one respect, too, we're doing, we're doing a lot with COT to make sure that uh, we can accommodate some of the advice that we're giving. And I hope that you guys, for your family's sakes, have gotten a meeting place just in case communications are lost. That, that's, uh, that's number one on the list. Just in case you don't have a cell phone, you don't have a landline, always have a meeting place where your family can meet up if you don't have communications. Please, please have someone in your family designate a place so that everybody knows where that is. Please do that. That'll save. There have been so many times uh, I've seen people in other countries when they lost communications. It's not a good thing for parents to wonder where their children are, right? At a very oppressive state, it's not good for people not to know the whereabouts of their family members, period, right? So set up a meeting place, some sort of meeting place. Also, time intervals. And what that means is if, uh, for example, if something happened to the communications, um, try and think of a way that contact can be made between you and your kids by way of meeting people at locations, right? Even a relay point would be good. Um, but take, take a little bit of time and try and get that, uh, try and get that uh, set so your family knows about it. Because when communications are lost, that's when real panic sets in. And if you have a place where you can meet up with your family, right? Even if it takes all day, you can stay there until your family members get there. Then you can have whatever plan you're going to have. I would also keep your locations away from highways, major roads, things like that. Okay? That's something common to do. And, and a person may say, well, why have that plan? Nothing is happening. Well, the same reason you have insurance. The exact same reason, right? You don't want to be in a situation where you really need it. And you don't have it. You want to have it and, and not need it, right? Just have that plan. Better to have it not need it than to really need it. And you don't have it, okay? It's a precaution because we don't know. You know, you never know how, how far humanity will go. You don't know. We don't know what the Lord will allow to happen in the earth. We don't know that. We don't know. We know by way of prophecy what will ultimately happen. We don't know all the mechanisms um, that will happen in place. And the Lord's given us what? He's given us a mind. He's given us technology to make plans, to have things ready. He's given us everything we need to prepare, right? You don't want to be one of those individuals who had everything at their fingertips and did nothing, right? You don't want that. Somebody says, what if you're... But if you live alone, uh, still have a place. Listen to me. You have a friend. Uh, there are people out there that have more than one friend, right? Set up a meeting place. Never force anybody to do it, right? But just set up a meeting place. Let people know where you're going to be if something happens. So you have to do. Let people know, hey, communications are lost. I'm going to show up here, you know, a couple of hours a day or something like that. Just let them know. It's a very good tactic because uh, we did that in rotations a few times without using communications, right? And somebody can show up every so many hours, and believe me, contact will be made. But you have to have that, that location set so that everybody can get together and then hatch a plan. 
It'll give you peace of mind. It'll give you, uh, it'll save you some tears and anxiety and everything else should something happen. And, and I believe that something is going to happen. I do not believe people are going to be properly uh, prepared for this. I don't. If you're not prepared right now, right, chances are you're not going to be prepared. Just won't. Hmm? Somebody says, can Asia expect the same as the USA? Well, you know, no. Here's why. Here's why. I think it's time for us to get sober about our leadership. I'm going to be talking about our leadership more and more as time goes on, but not in the way that, you know, uh, uh, people will talk about that on the Internet. I'm not here to advise anybody about my own personal opinions. The Lord gave us a task and a responsibility concerning leadership. And I believe in the word of God. I do not believe in the word of men. I believe in the word of God, right? And so uh, we have a responsibility concerning our leadership. Now, 37 asks, uh, can Asia expect the same thing we expect? I would say no. I would say no because things have already transpired. And no one has lifted a finger to help. Let me give you guys the situation. Maybe if you don't see it this way, maybe you do. But um, we're all part of a family called humanity. Everybody know that, right? All of us are, except for those who are not. But we're all part of a family called humanity. So let me get your, uh, let me get your mindset uh, thinking a different way. As time has progressed, humanity has made accomplishments. And normally, uh, people pick their favorite side of humanity. I don't do that. I don't pick groups. I don't pick sides. I don't pick races. I don't pick any of that stuff. Because we're all part of humanity, right? Because I'm a believer in Christ, and I'm, I'm very highly hopeful that you are, very confident that many of you are. You are part of a royal family, a very real royal family, right? You have a very real father that is not human, all right? He's not human. We have a very real king of kings and lord of lords. That's what we have, right? So humanity, we've been called. We've been called to intercede for humanity. We've been called to assist humanity. As we've been called to do. Everybody who answers the call early, right? You have a responsibility for humanity itself. And you're part of that family of humanity. Everything you see in the realm of humans or humanity, right? Is simply you at a different time in your life. Pick out the worst person in the world. Pick them out, right? That same person is you. At a different time. It's you at a different time. Right? It's your shadow. It's somebody else. Don't look at human age, at the age of the body, the way we count time. Don't look at that. A person who is a babe is somebody who's just come to the knowledge of the truth. That person is a babe. A person could be a Christian all their lives, right? But th th maybe they didn't come to that knowledge of the truth where they would actually accept the responsibilities and tasks of a kingdom citizen to intercede for the world, right? So you have mature people, right? And you have young ones. In the eyes of God, all of us are young amongst each other, some of us, right? Or, or maybe a little wiser than the other. No big deal. No big deal. That's not a gauge on your quality either. That just simply means some people have been in this longer than others. And some people that have been in there uh, longer and have gone through much, they have a lot to share. That's all, right? The wiser a person is, the less they brag about what they know. Keep that in mind. The younger a person is, or the more immature a person is, the more they brag on what they know. So, any of us Christians, those of us who believe in Christ, if we ever brag about what we know over somebody else, that makes us immature, spiritually immature. That's what it does. If you find a person who's very slow to speak and quick to listen, that person has wisdom to share. They do. 
they also consequently, they, they likely, you, you know, the probability is super high that they really care about you, right? They really care about you. Humanity has times when they fall, times when they fight, times when they come together, right? We know that humanity is unified when they're trying to survive some external threat from something or somebody else. We know that, right? We know that when times get very hard, you can have two people that can't stand each other on a day-to-day -day basis. When times get really hard, that one person may fight for the other person. So there are humanity shows. In our times of freedom where we can do what we want to do, where we can exercise and discover or try to discover who we are, that's when we normally mess up and mess up royally because we're dealing with with a very dark overlord here on this earth. A, a very dark one, and it's very real. I know a lot of people are waiting for, like, like this uh, strong delusion. Let me pull something up so it can help us out. Some of you guys have choppy sound. You guys let me know if the sound degrades, okay? Let, please let me know. Just start saying it all in the chat rooms if it starts to go out, okay? And I can... Uh, uh, do my part here to help clean up some things, right? Somebody says, uh, Mike, who digged ground and cash near home for future use, military survival. Yeah, well, a lot of us have done that. We have. Yeah, keep this in mind. I wouldn't store, I would not store precious metals in the ground. They will be confiscated if you're doing that. They will. They're, don't do that. Don't do that. Well, let me read this, guys. Let me read this to you so that we can uh, uh, go on with this because let me get what I'm saying first. Now, humanity, humanity, I'm no different than the people you hate in humanity, the people you don't like, right? I'm no different than them. I'm them at a different stage. I've accepted certain responsibilities among humanity, but mostly for the Lord, right? I'm not expecting everybody to understand what I've accepted of the Lord. But I take the tasks seriously, and we are to pray for our leaders. Why should we pray for our leaders? Anybody know? Why should we pray for them? Should we just pray and nothing ever happened, nothing ever changes, this, that, and the other? Right? Is that why we pray? No. Your prayers are communication to the Most High. Your prayers, right? If you can think of it this way, every time you pray, you're at a royal court of the Lord, fully visible to the Most High, not in a sinful way, but by way of your requests. And if you're familiar with Revelation, there will come a time when the prayers of the saints will ascend up into the, uh, the throne of God, and God will do what? What will he do? He'll begin to take vengeance upon those who dwell upon the earth. Why would he do it then? The prayers of the saints that ascend, those are the ones that are like those who are under the altar, right? The fifth seal, right? The, those souls who are underneath the altar, and they said, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not avenge us of them that dwell upon the earth? And he told them to wait a little longer, until their fellow brethren would be killed as they were. Until so if you think you're going to be one of those under the altar, those people were killed for the word of God. There are lots of people who are not them. Those are different people. That's why they're under the altar. They're under the altar because they were in a fight from day, day one. But they were assigned to do what they do. Those are the, you know who they are, don't you? Right, Enoch in the book of Enoch it describes that same altar and it says those are the, those martyrs are the prophets. The prophets. It's been there have been a lot of prophets. There have been a lot of martyrs, right? Who constantly, constantly preached the word of God constantly, and they were jailed and they were beaten. All sorts of things happened. They're under the altar. It's only a certain number of those to be killed as they were, right? 
And and guys, listen, I don't, I don't really get deep into theology. I don't do that because the Lord can describe himself. He didn't need me to go in any deep thing uh, uh, knowing about him. The Lord is best at describing himself. And so if you have that proper relationship, you'll know all the deep things of the living God. But that, that too, is a great responsibility. Anyway, being a part of humanity, being a part of humanity, you experience everything, every potential human on this earth would experience. You do. Collectively, as, as one single family, we are progressing. Every single day we progress. But there's an element amongst humanity. I want to talk to you about that thing among humanity. Now, and it has to deal with a delusion. Everybody has heard of uh, deception, right? The deception, I, I think that people used to call it the great deception. That's not what we're talking about. Uh, we're not talking about any great deception. In fact, Forgive me on this too, but when I first heard somebody say the great deception, I said, well, that's not even in the word of God. I did. But what is that? What is the great deception? That's what people thought of, right? Because they started to point to everything saying that everything was a great deception. And, and so in Second Thessalonians uh, 2, 3, we began to read about what was really about to happen. I, this absolutely about to happen. The Lord said he would, he would do something, right? He said he would do something. Do you guys know what that is? Let, let's read the whole thing. Let no man deceive you by any means. By any means. Not by education, theology. Not by a Bible study like this one. Not by a guy like me talking to you. By any means. For that day, they were talking about that day. What day? Well, let's identify that day so that everybody's on the same page. At the beginning, it says, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the, our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, troubled, neither in spirit, nor by word, nor by letter from us as that day of Christ is at hand. Now, take note of something. He told them back then, way back then, don't be troubled. He did not tell you not to be troubled. He's telling them. He's talking to his audience, and this happened thousands of years ago, right? He said, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling way first. We have been seeing this for a long time. Since Christ ascended to the heavens, since people converted to Christianity, the falling away has been underway for hundreds of years. Wouldn't you say? Wouldn't you? How many tyrants have rose up in the earth and people were Christians, and they perverted Christianity. How many? How many? Lots. That's a falling away. When a person falls away, they fall away from what? From their state of being in, in relation to the Lord. Right? Let's continue to read. Except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. That means the son of perdition must be revealed. Listen, that day is not coming, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed. If he's going to be revealed, you do not need to hunt for him. Every time God says something is going to be revealed, believe me, all the saints will know about it. All of them. So you don't have to go hunt for him. You don't have to name everybody. When God reveals something, he's going he's gonna to reveal it to all of us, not just two of us, not one of us, not five, not a special group, but to every single person out there who believes in him, right? Even the ones that can't seem to get things right, they're going to know who it is. Why? Because God is not a lawyer. He doesn't play tricks. He's not going to reveal it and say, well, you didn't read the fine print. Right? He didn't do that. Everybody's going to know because he works in the realm of what? Truth. And with just balances. Right? Not crooked balances, but just balances. So everybody's going to know who this guy is or who this thing is. When it's revealed, you don't have to guess. You don't have to do any of that. If God said he's going to have that person revealed, 
that person is going to be revealed. The son of perdition, that word perdition means doom. And who is this guy? He opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. Now, that's a very curious phrase. If somebody exalts themselves above all that is called God, well, no wonder it said that this person is going to worship a God his fathers knew not. A strange God will he increase, right? He's going to do that every day. But it's a, it's a God his fathers knew not. It's the God of force. The God of force. Do you guys know what the God of force is? The worship of force has been around for a long time. Long time. And it has a few different forms. Right? A few different forms. Take note of that. If it's a God his fathers knew not, he's going to start worshiping something. That is not anything we're familiar with. It's not. Not as a worship thing. Somebody says witchcraft. Uh, the God of force. That's why it tricks so many people. People are doing that right now. You think he's going to come and worship uh, something, right? Listen, he's going to worship something and not have support of the entire world. You better believe he will. Back in the day. Force was a term used to express a specific discipline. Much of the vocabulary today has been altered. It's different. It's changed, right? Now, there's a phrase people continue to use, especially when COVID-19 came out. They kept saying, what? You must trust the science. Isn't that what they said? They said, you must trust the science. That's what they said. That's what they kept saying. That's what everybody kept saying. Trust the science. And at that point, when people began to say that, I recoiled at the people who were embracing science like a type of worship because they put that above everything. See, if, if they were telling you to trust the science, what that really means is you got to live your life and make decisions based on the science. Oh, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Live your life. Listen, to trust the science means when you make a decision, make sure you make a decision based off the data. Where's the data coming from? Where is it coming from? A small guild. It's not coming from everybody. What they're actually saying is you got to trust the group of people who are putting out this data for the entire world, right now people are duped. You think a strong delusion is coming? That strong delusion is already in place, and people are being given over to it daily. Daily. And they can't even escape because they don't even know it's a delusion. A person who is delusional has no idea he's in a fake world. He believes that everything is real. He's buying everything he sees or she sees. See that? A delusion. If a person is delu Now listen, this is important. This is important. Does a delusion make something absolutely deceitful? Does it? No. A delusion is based on perspective, isn't it? All of us are living at the same time, but all of us see the world differently, each one of us. You may see a problem in the government that is one of those unsolvable issues. I may see it as nothing. We see the exact same thing. Our interpretation of what we see is different. Remember that. Now, as I said before, many people said, yeah, the, you know, this, this, uh, they're good. The people are going to be, the, you know, they're going to be deceived or they're going to, what, what was that word I used? It? Not delusion, but, um, a, a deception. They're going to be deceived. This great deception was coming. That's a mistake. Let, let me read this. Now, I know what the Bible says in the other parts where it says, you know, if, if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived, but that means they won't be deceived. That's what that means. They will not be deceived. God's people are not going to be deceived because God won't allow that. 
deception is different. If somebody's openly trying to deceive you, right, then that's a big lie. It is. That's a big lie. And if you fall for it, you're going to believe a lie, correct? You're going to believe a lie. You're going to believe a lie. Well, a delusion in this case, a, a, that deception is something like Satan conjuring up something and people believe it, right? I'm going to show you a big difference in something here. Because if Satan or the Antichrist conjured up something and people believed it, that would be awful, correct? But let's go ahead and read what happens here in this case. Let me continue to read. We know about this guy who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself as God, right? So this guy is all about himself, all about what he wants to set any other. But let's skip down. I'm going to go back to the rest here shortly, but let's skip down and it says this. But It says this. It describes this individual and it says, he is, he's, he's even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, right? And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perished. Oh, oh, wait a minute. In them that perished. We have to make a distinction. Now, this is a side note because this is not what we're talking about here, but this Antichrist figure, this son of perdition, this man of doom, right, person of doom, when he comes forward, those who will believe him, right, are those who are going to perish. Listen, listen to this. Oh, let me back up and read this whole thing. It says, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. That means it's ongoing. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. So there's something obscuring the iniquity. So you can't tell it's iniquity. And it says, and then, but once he's moved out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. That's his audience. Those that perish, those that will perish with him, right? Right? Or those who don't believe. Now, let me continue. Because they received not the love of the truth. That's the difference. That's it. Receiving the love of the truth. Suppose I received the truth and I was militant and callous, full of scales, harsh, right? Trying to make people bend to my understanding of the word, beating up on your head if you didn't. That is not, that is not receiving the word of God in love. When you receive the word of God, First of all, it is a message of absolute hope. And what is that message? The message is, though we are full of sin, full of sin, though we are doomed on every side, though we have broken every single commandment, because if you break one, you've broken them all, a sacrifice was given for us, given. It was given for us. Listen. It was a gift to us. And if it's a gift to us, nobody can take it away. And if it's a gift to us, we did not earn it. And if it's a gift to us, then all this stuff that people are talking, trying to control people with the word of God, right? You don't do that because salvation is a gift. Now, with a gift, you either accept it or you do not. Correct? which means you have accepted it. Now you're working it out. People work their salvation out at different levels all the time. You have to make that distinction also. It does not condemn a person if they're behind you, if they're not catching on to what you're saying, because that person has accepted the gift. It's a gift. It was given. But you have some people that don't receive it. The love of the truth. 
When you love the truth, guess what? You love forgiveness. When you love the truth, you love what Jesus did. When you love the truth, you love what Jesus did for the one you can't stand, for the one you're blaming. Uh Uh-oh. Stepped on a toad, didn't I? Uh Uh-oh. Stepped on a toad. How many of you are Catholic? Or it could be ex-Catholic, but Catholic. And the reason why I'm saying that is because I know the differences of beliefs between the Catholics, right? And just the raw word of God, which is what I like to talk about here. Catholics believe in a little different. There's, there's some differences there. But let me tell you something. It's still a gift. It is not earned. It's a gift. And you are recognized by the Messiah directly. 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 Now, not to dethrone anybody, nor to go against any articles that you may have, because God is transitioning all of us through the knowledge of Christ as we grow with him. As we continue to say, yes, we're not lost. Do you hear me? That means you can be a full-on Catholic right now. Continue to say yes to Christ, and he will lead you beyond the exploits of mankind. He will guide you directly. Directly. It's still a gift. It is not earned. And if it's not earned, then you don't have to pay a price to keep it. Because it was given. See, when God gives something, he didn't do like we do and take it back. Or you're not using, let me take it back. That's like people say, you know, you you have gifts from the Lord. And if you don't use it, he's going to take it back. No, he will not. Or he wouldn't have given it in the first place. Have you ever read anywhere where God gave a gift and took the gift back? No. People who have the gift of the Holy Ghost who were endowed with the power of the Holy Ghost. He didn't take it back. He didn't do that. They gave up the ghost. When they defiled the Holy Spirit, they gave up the ghost. When they cheated against the Holy Spirit, they gave up the ghost. God did not take it back. God is not a man that he would do anything like man. Everybody is taught. Everybody has a culture. Catholics have their culture. But listen to me. Baptists, they have their culture. Seventh-day Adventists, they have their culture. All these denominations, they have their culture. But the Lord is raising you, and he loves you. Do you hear me? He's going to raise you beyond the articles of man. That means you don't stand defiant of everything. You seek the truth. And the Lord will grant you and give you that truth. As you're able to walk more and more. He can't give it to you all at one time. He can't do that. You know why? Because what if a person stood up in the middle of a Catholic mass and said, all of you are this, that, and the other, and stormed out. Does that edify the living God? No, it does not. You know what would edify the living God? When God would work through a person in a mass, and it went outside of their articles, But they didn't do it. The Lord did it upon them, and people were witnesses to it. That's how chains are broken, when God works in his vessels. Chains are not broken when we open our big mouths. That's not how chains are broken. Chains are not broken when we direct them to be broken and want all the attention. Chains are broken when people see the truth. That's when chains are broken. When people see the truth, chains are broken. You know how people go to, they say, well, nobody's listening to me. Let me tell you something, guys. If I were to speak to people and not a soul would listen, I got to go back to the drawing board because I'm not making a difference anywhere. But I've learned something very simple. When you set yourself aside, when you're handling God's word, People begin to hear God's word no matter what the circumstances are. No matter what the circumstances are. People begin to hear God's word. 
then it's almost indisputable. Do you not know that, that by way of the Holy Spirit, the Lord said he would give you words that no one would be able to gain say against? Do you know that? So the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit is actually utilizing a person, people start to change things, begin to happen. When we open our mouths with our wisdom, we start messing everything up. But when the Holy Spirit speaks, there are no mistakes. It's always going to reach its intended audience. It's very simple. Just be a vessel. That's all. If you express your methods and you want the credit or you want somebody to move by your methodology, you're messing up. Why do that when the Holy Spirit can work through you? See, when you want, if you saw somebody that was injured, you're not going to go to your kitchen and pull out a knife and a fork and a screwdriver and say, here, let me fix it. When you love that person, you know what you're going to do? doesn't matter who you are. You're going to say, hey, i got to get you to someone who is a physician. And if somebody jogs off the street and says, ooh, I think I can fix it. No, I need a physician. Because you'll instantly know what you're looking for for the sake of that person you love. That's what happens when you love somebody. When you love someone, you want them to have the best help. You don't want them to have some experimental thing going on, right? You want them to have the best help. So you find a physician. You don't even try and fix it. Now, if you're prideful and a person is hurt because it happens all the time, they'll say, ooh, I, you know, I was in, I've, I've dealt with this before. They move the person. The person dies. Get to the uh, hospital. They find out, well, they, they had a broken, they had a fractured neck. And when you move that. You just killed the whole thing. You didn't stabilize anything, right? So what I'm telling you is that when the Lord uses us, when he does that, then we're used as vessels that he may work directly with a person. That's the best help a person can have, isn't it? All too often, we don't experience that because we're always trying to repeat a solution as somebody else so that let me just step on some toes here you don't 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 comment openly don't say no that's not me don't say just hold your peace but normally the people that are around you especially if you're a christian you do have compassion and love but also you're a christian for a reason something broke down on you in your life you noticed people and they were harsh and sometimes cruel they were you have been broken by way of the heart you have been sad many of you have been oppressed and depressed you have you've gone through some very sad moments ultimately you came to the lord because you perceived your true position in this world and when you came to the lord he lifted you a bit and when he lifted you a bit you look at those same people who said all, who said you didn't matter, right? Who just blew you off, right? You look at those same people and you want them to see you for who you are as being a Christian, which is relevant with something that matters. And so all too often, a lot of Christians are trying to go back to their loved ones to demonstrate to them the same people that potentially hurt them, those same people they're trying to matter to those people, and they want them to hear the word of God that they have to give them, and they want them to accept it. So ultimately, they will say that you matter. Listen to me carefully. You don't have to do that. You already matter. See, because when you want somebody to have the word of God, in your heart of hearts, it doesn't matter who comes. It just matters that someone comes. If I really love someone, they don't have to listen to me. They don't even have to get the word from me. It just matters to me that they get the word. That they learn who the position is. That they build that relationship with Christ. That word does, it never has to come through me. And do you know what the number one complaint of many Christians are? Well, the people in my family won't listen to me. Stop trying to make them listen. 
If you love them, ask the Lord to send someone with the word. Be sincere. Try not to fall into the trap of trying to prove yourself to the very ones who said you did not matter. Because you know what? You do matter. Or you would not believe in Christ. God put you in that family, which means you were relevant from day one. Those people who do well in the world, who are well-versed in the world, who seem to get along with the world, the Lord told you, do not befriend the world. Do you not know a friend of the world is is at enmity with God? Of course you're different. Of course you see things different. Of course you're going to be you're going to be, you're not going to want to 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 put 100% in some of the subjects in the world because you've been called from the beginning. How did you figure that out? I used to think sometimes when I was younger, I had zero interest in how people operated in the earth. I couldn't stand how they operated. It was mischievous. It was greedy. It was full of greed. It was dog eat dog. It was the strongest wins. And then he dies from somebody else. It was miserable. And I saw the end of it. And I wanted no part of that. I didn't. I didn't. It was very quiet, very observant. But I didn't want the ways of the world. And as I started to grow, I, I became part of the world. And I saw it from the inside out. Then I saw it from the back door to the front. You know, those doors that hardly nobody wants to go behind. I've been back there with the enemy. And it just proves the point. Because we don't know the depth of the darkness of some of the things that we want to become. We start complaining in our hearts about those things. And there's no reason to. Because what God has set you aside for, few, few, very few, have achieved in the first place. God has set you aside from the world to understand his word. Yes, it's going to be different from those who are part of the world. It's going to be a bit more compassionate bit more in depth, it's going to cause you some frustration because people around you will hear the word of God one way. You're going to hear it another way. The people around you may not be touched, and you're going to be touched. Most of you have become very good at hiding the moments when you're touched, right? Many of you have such compassionate hearts. You can't even, you can't watch certain movies with other people around you because It wouldn't move them, but it moves you. You were the one that was running around and nobody ever knew you were hurt over the things that were said and you tried to act like you were not hurt. Most of your childhood, I can almost guarantee that you were hurt a lot by the most foolish things. And that just shows a godly tenderness in your heart. That's all. Because you can't be hurt if you don't comprehend the situation. And you know what that means? That means you comprehended that situation early on a very deep level, a spiritual level, before you knew what spiritual was. You could see beyond what was being presented. So listen to me. That means you're, you've been relevant this entire time. You don't have to go back and prove yourself to anybody. Make God use you as a vessel. Let him finish the work he began in you. Right? You don't, you never have to prove yourself to people. You're put here to intercede. You're put here for the sake of the Lord's word. You matter already. Now, Listen to this. This thing, right? Second Thessalonians 2.11. And for this cause, 
What cause? Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. They didn't receive that, right? They believed this false one that comes. He says, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. Who's going to send it? God, not Satan. God. Who's going to send it? God. Who's going to send it? Not Bluebeam. God will send them a strong delusion. Who's going to send it? The living God's going to send it. He'll send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned who loved not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Listen to me. Do you know what that means? That does not happen overnight, number one. If you have pleasure in unrighteousness, do you know what happens? You start saying the words that people have been saying for hundreds of years. There's nothing wrong with this. There's nothing wrong with doing this. There's nothing wrong with doing that. There's nothing wrong with wearing this. There's nothing wrong with that activity. This is harmless. There's nothing wrong with this. That means people have already been given over to a strong delusion, and that delusion has been here, and God has given them over to it. See, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Everybody would notice it's a delusion if it were E.T., why can't they see what's happening right now? Right now, they are believing a lie. You know what that lie is? Here's a lie. You ready? That all this junk they're showing on television is harmless. That changing the sex of a child is harmless. That aborting children is harmless. Do you know how many things are practiced in this earth right now that people are saying are harmless, and I'm talking about Christians, people who say they believe, ah, but they have, not, they have not loved the truth. When you love something, you're going to search it out. This world is nasty. Nasty. People being wrongfully incarcerated. A handful of people running many things in the earth. Are you kidding? This world is full of disgust. When the greedy and the cruel rule, and now you have Christians who want to be like the greedy and the cruel, where you can curse out of your mouth to the same audience you just blessed. And the audience claps anyway. Pastors have become few. A pastor, do you know what that word means? First of all, leadership is servanthood. Leadership is not dictating policy to everybody in that it. Leadership is servitude. The greatest leaders could serve everybody. A great leader is not the one who called all the shots. A great leader is the one who served everyone. But all that's twisted now. Not one leader. You see leaders in this world who don't have calluses. They're not dirty enough. They don't even know the common language of the people. They're disconnected. They manage, they set policy for what they think people want. You know what that is? That's called a dictatorship. The opposite of a dictatorship is when the people actually have a voice. Whatever the people want. That's what happens in that country when it's not a dictatorship or monarchy. Or all these other archies out there. That's not what we have. There are people who are never contacted. There are groups of people who are never contacted. They could care less what those people think. You know what people you know what people look to now? 
musical artists. They worship musical artists and actress and actors like gods. They dress like them. They play all their music. They think like them. When something happens, they replicate what's in the song. And that's normally from ages of 8 to 80. To love the truth is to love God's word. To love God's word is to know what that word is. And God's word surrounds Jesus Christ. God's word points to Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ was a sacrifice for all mankind. That all those who had sin can become sinless through his sacrifice. That a way has been made to reestablish mankind on his original path. Forgiveness. Those who love forgiveness are the ones who practice it. The ones who can't do without it. The ones that live to forgive, not the ones who have an issue forgiving. That comes from the world. That, that an issue forgiving comes when a person believes what the world is doing and saying. There is no issue with forgiveness for a person who is full of the word of God. There is only an issue of forgiveness when people believe the deceits of the world, that world you've been called out of. God said you're apart from the world. That's how you make a difference in the world. And when you pray, you're praying to the Most High. That prayer is possible by Jesus Christ, not by any other, but by Christ. And except you go through Christ, no one gets to God. Delusion, that delusion has been established. How many people, there are so many people who believe in the world and the world's causes. Don't be deceived. The world has given people what? A shelter over their heads they must slave for. You have to pay for your water, pay for your air. You got to pay for everything, which, which actually is not that bad because it induces a type of responsibility. But we're talking about a control mechanism over the people. That's no different from slavery. You cannot pick up and go to another country when you want to. You cannot. You can't. You cannot do what you want to do in any country. You cannot. You have to become a part of that system, learn that system, be loyal to the system, serve that system, and then you'll be rewarded by that system. But if you're devoted to the living God, there's only so far you can go in the system before your morale meter goes down to zero, before the compromise comes. People think nothing is wrong with that. People think nothing is wrong with this secular stuff. How many of you think nothing is wrong listening to the radio, the, the common radio in your car with secular music? I'll tell you right now, I can listen to music. I can. I can listen to it. I can. Do you know why? Because it does not influence me. I know exactly what it is. That's why. I don't live my life by the words of any song. That'll never happen. Oh, and I have no desire to hear most of that stuff. I do like melodies, but there are certain melodies I will not listen to. Because I will allow nothing to move me in any direction save the truth. That's my choice. I will not emulate... Every time you listen to a song, you're not aware of what music actually is. You end up living what's written in that song. Do you know that? 
That's why I'm so meticulous. See, it doesn't matter if I listen to it because guess what? I will never make that a part of my life. There's, there are, I'm so picky with music, it's not funny. I am. That goes with certain Christian music, too. There, there's certain Christian things I will not listen to. I will not listen to it. Because it does not reflect the message of Jesus Christ. It just simply doesn't. But when you're spiritually aware, and when you start seeing behind the scenes, then you find out most of that music is dedicated you know why you're moved by certain songs? You know why teenagers are moved by certain songs? Because they dedicate those songs amongst a council who evokes demons to go out with every copy of that song. So every time that song is played, a demonic entity is with that song to magnify emotions in that thing. All you have to do is ask. If something moves you, listen to me, it's, it's very simple. When something moves you, especially, guys, have you noticed I like songs without words? Do you know why? I put my own words to it. I do. I do. I don't, I don't, I don't really like the words of the world. I left that. Why would I go back there? I left that. Is there anything wrong with you guys listening? You, what you have to do is do what's right in your life. Right? But I know this about me. If I let any portion of my standards drop. It's going to be a port of entry of darkness. Everything within me will start changing. I'll go backward. I will. I'll go backward. In my closeness with the Lord that I have that I have right now, it won't be there. I'm not doing that. I'm not going to risk it. I'm not going to risk it. It's a daily fight, ladies and gentlemen, no matter who. It doesn't matter who you are. It not matter who you are. The more... The more you recognize these things, the more you're going to have to fight. But guess what? God did not give you knowledge of all these things, did he? He didn't. He didn't. You know, when the Bible, it, it, it gives an answer to that, that the Lord did not burn you with all this knowledge because it would have you to the point where you cannot live life at all. Do you know that? One of the apostles, you had to read it yourself, but one of the apostles said, thank God that he has not given you all this knowledge because you would not be able to live your life you can live your life free you don't have to suffer one of them said you don't have to suffer what they suffered you don't so live your life keep your innocence keep your innocence but live your life live your life live your life unto the lord to everything, to everybody on this earth, to humanity, whatever you would do to a person, do as you would do unto the Lord. That's what you do. And you won't make, you won't make some of the moves you've been making that could potentially be causing you to reap darkness in your life. But you have to make that choice. I can't sit here and tell you Right? That, well, listening to music is wrong. No, that's up to the individual. You know, when the Bible it says, if you think something is a sin, then you shouldn't do it. Do you know that? Do you know that? Hmm? Back to the delusion. Do you guys see how a delusion is already here in this world? And we've not been talking about these negative aspects of the world for a long time, but this has been set up. We were born into it. And because we were born into it, we don't call it a dark kingdom. That's not what we call it. We're used to it. We're used to the music and the movies. Come on, let's go ahead and face the music. Stop acting like we had white robes on from birth because you didn't. We, we, we're used to it. We call it home. We do not see the points of entrapment in this world. That's something as you, you know, get introduced to things, you begin to see. And God's grace is sufficient. What I'm telling you now is don't seek out these things of the world, knowing, I'm, I'm telling you right now, there are traps all over the place. All over the place. 
But if anything moves you in the opposite direction of your Father in heaven, cut it out. If anything challenges the knowledge of God in your life, cut it off. If anything would cause you to go against humanity, get away from it. Isn't that what's in the word of God? Hmm? Get away from it. Because when you expose your life to it, everything you see, everything you hear becomes a part of your environment. Now you have to deal with it. And you have to deal with everything attached to it. And you'll lose your mind. Some people have lost their minds. They're trying desperately to get back to that point of innocence to the living God. But they got so many negative thoughts they can't even get anything right. They'll always have some negative connotation to everything, to everything. Because they have too much of the world in them. God's word is simplicity. I'm telling you now, it's simple. It is not complicated. Humanity makes things complicated. See, Satan is the author of what? What is he the author of? Somebody, tell me. He's the author of, starts with a C, he's the author of confusion, correct? So how do you confuse a person? You make something too complicated, don't you? And when you make something too complicated, the knowledge of it is lost. Nobody can utilize the knowledge they have. That's living your life in wisdom in a wise way. You can't utilize that knowledge, right? So if you can't utilize it, you're, there are people running around. They know, but they can't do. They can't act. They're still in turmoil. They have knowledge, but they have no wisdom, no ability to apply that knowledge to their lives. Why? They have complicated too much of it. It's almost like they'll read the Bible, but then they'll read Instead of saying, you know, like this scripture, and for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion. They can take that one sentence and break that down to 12,000 pages. That's too complicated. That's too complicated. They will create their own context. They will. If you don't believe me, let me give you the dictionary thing. When people use a dictionary to define what the words are in the Bible, it would be okay if there was one definition per word, but that's not what's happening, is it? There's like seven or eight definitions per word. And so what does a person do? A person will pick and choose what they think fits. That's not the way to go. The word of God, it is written, the word of God must be understood spiritually. Now, if you understand that spiritually, that means to understand or comprehend the word of God, that's got to come by revelation. Revelation. That's how you rightly define the word of truth, by revelation from the living God. You don't go pick out 20 definitions and then pick the one that suits your life. Because if you start doing that, you'll read and defend your lifestyle at the same time. You know what that means? You'll cushion the discipline of God so that it does not accuse you in front of anybody else. That means you're going to alter definitions. So that you'll always look like you're in conformance to the word of God. And I can tell you right now, I'll never read the word like that. If it does not smash my toes, it's not the word of God. If it's just going to sit there and edify and excuse my flesh, how can that be the word of God? We all know what we're doing. All of us do. Whether we, whether we admit that or not, we know what we're doing. We do. We may not discuss that with everybody else, but we know every skeleton in our own closets. We know exactly what they are. And if the word of God were to ever just excuse it from our lives, how could that be the word of God? That delusion has been here for a long time. And there are people in that delusion right now. And if they don't, Accept Christ with all truth, they'll never come out of that delusion. They don't even know it's a delusion. They think it's real. They think the systems of the world, that's how everything is. 
that's delusional. That is not how things are. They think that when they're out here in the world hustling and bustling, that's all there is. That's not all there is. That's not. Even the people, even some of you guys that think you're by yourselves, you're not by yourself. You're never by yourself. Never. Some of you folks, you start complaining about things, right? You, you start counting up all your losses. You've forgotten all your blessings. We remember how much we're blessed when we start losing things like our health, don't we? Huh? Your hair is falling out. Your teeth took a nap. All sorts of things. And then you'll remember back, oh, I should have took care of this. I should have took care of that. I should have took care of this. That's when you remember what your blessings actually were. You couldn't see them because you were in a delusion. You couldn't recognize them. That's delusional, isn't it? Isn't that delusional? Come on, somebody. And if we don't come to the knowledge of the truth by way of the word of God, we're in a what? A delusion. And who allowed all of this to be set up in the earth in the first place? The living God did. He allows or does not. So he allowed it. And we can see the kingdom of the beast daily being set up. What do you call it? A delusion. See, everybody's waiting on E.T. They think that's going to be the delusion. But you see what's happening? And always pointing to something like that coming. They can't even see what they're falling for now. They're delusional. They think there is no delusion. They think there is no deceit, no deception. Do you see how delusional that is? That's almost like saying there is no sin. Do you see how delusional that is? Do you see that? They think that this man of perdition, that's when Satan actually comes. That's when he starts working. What? That is delusional. That's delusional. Can't you see that when he comes, he's already going to have all of his citizens with him? In other words, before he ever arrives, he's got loyalists already. And guess what? He's really about to arrive. Are you starting to see how delusional, how that delusion is actually already in place? It's already in place. People continue to wait for the big things. They're already in a delusion. How does a person exit that delusion? You have to love the truth because when you love the truth, you'll accept the ways of the living God. You believe the words of Yeshua HaMashiach. And when that happens, you start looking at the world and you say, uh-uh, that's all wrong. The Lord said, don't do that. And they're doing that. The Lord said, get away from all that. And they're running to it. That's when you start seeing the delusion is here already. That's when you see it. You were born into it. At what point will a person on this earth realize they've been born in the end times? You know how people say the end times are coming? Is that what they're going to say when they're born in the time of the Antichrist? They're not going to call it the Antichrist. They'll call it Mr. President or something like that, won't they? They're not going to call it Antichrist because when you're born in the last days, you're not going to call those the last days because you're seeking to have a good time. But if we truly were in the last days, then from birth, from birth, every time we would seek to go out into the world, something would happen to let us know we don't belong there. Some evil thing would rear its head to put us in our place. We wouldn't be able to join nor go to the heights as the rest of the world. Something would knock us down if we were in the last days. Oh, that's what's been happening to all of you, isn't it? Because if it's an evil place and you're marked for salvation, the world does not like you. It will try to take everything from you. Maybe that's why most of you were assaulted, attacked, abandoned, and everything else when you were young. 
because you were born in the last days into a very dark world. But because you were born in the middle of it, you don't call it dark. You can see it, but you don't want to see it. There are so many people right now hoping it gets better. They're hoping, oh, I want it to get better is what they say. They're trying to select the perfect person to make everything better. It's not going to work. They just can't see that yet. It is progressively and consistently going downhill quickly. And nothing has been able to reverse it. You would only see that in the last days. Hmm? I'll be back in a few minutes right here at COT, everybody. Just in a few minutes. I'll be right back. Okay, everybody, I'm back once again. All right, we got that delusion segment over here. You know, guys, that was uh, that was not anticipated. It really wasn't. But it came out of anyway. We do live in a world full of delusions. It is, and God sent it. God allowed it. And I hope that you guys can see that, right? There's a work to be done. So what do you do? Something else you need to know. First of all, how many of you want to leave the earth? Just just leave this whole process, right? If the Lord came right now and said, let's go, would you go? How many would want to go enthusiastically? I think all of us would. If the Lord came back. Right? And said that? I wouldn't deny it. I wouldn't. Wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't deny it at all. I'd be like, let's go. That means I'm ready to go right now. Right? That's what it means. But he didn't come back yet. I have to address something. You know how people get in their minds, they want to leave the earth? We have to look at that real quick. I know it's not popular, but uh, the Lord sent us here. He did. Nobody else did. Nobody else sent you here. If you believe in Christ tonight, right, if you believe in him, you're sent here. You're meant to be here by the living God. And if you're alive, you're meant to be here in this very day. Think about that for a minute. Think for a moment. That it was God who gave you life, who put you here in this time, who put you wherever you are, whatever you grew up in, he did that. He did that all the way up into this very day. In fact, there's not a day God will, God is not orchestrating something in your life. I want you to remember that, right? But here's the problem. Many of us, we want to get out. We don't want to be here. Now, my question was, if Christ came back right now and said, let's go, would you go? I would go. Because that's the ultimate authority on leaving, right? He is the word of God, the king of kings and lord of lords, the lion of the tribe of Judah, right? So he's the one. He's the only one who could ever say that. And I would say yes. But he didn't say that yet. He did not. So the one thing I do not do is sit here on earth wishing I was gone because that's actually hoping against the will of God in my life. I'm not going to do that. The will of God is going to be accomplished. It is. Right? God is the reason you're here. He is the reason you're here, not Satan. He's not the reason you're here, not anybody else. The living God is the reason you're here. But if we're not careful, if we're not careful, we're sending out a petition saying, I know you send me here, but I don't want to be here. You know what that's really saying? I do not want your will in my life. I want to go. I don't want to do what you sent me here to do. That's what we're saying. That's what we're saying. Think about it. If God is, he is the sole reason you're here. He is. See, this is why you have little sneaky messages that start popping up over the earth and you have to be careful. Anybody can 
fall for this one. You have to be careful. There are many theories out there. Many. And if you start believing in something other than the word of God, you're going to believe that somehow you sent yourself here. That's what you're going to believe. You're going to believe that you're trapped here. You're not trapped here. You're not. You're going to start believing like the Hindus believe, that somehow you've been recycled. I'll tell you something. If you've been recycled, you're one of the ones who have been twice plucked up by the roots. Clouds without water. You're one of the ancient ones who have no other home. This is their last stop. Do you know that? That's why they try to preserve the earth. And it sounds like a beautiful thing. I'm trying to let you know they can't go anywhere else. And when this earth is gone, they are destroyed. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about the children of the fallen. They cannot go anywhere. See, that's why I like the book of Enoch, because it, it plainly stated that they would be known as evil spirits in the earth. And what would they want to do? To make war, to fight against one another, to wreak havoc in the earth, to do violence. That's what they want. They can't go anywhere else. So when it's over here, when the earth is done, when everything is done, guess what? They have nowhere to go. If the earth were destroyed right now, they would go to their eternal place of judgment. That's not where God sent them, though. They would roam the earth until the time of judgment. Do you know that? And they'd be known as evil spirits. And they would pop up as your granddaddies and your grandmas and children and whoever else you have a heart for that they can deceive you by. I want you guys to remember something so that you're not confused. Do you remember it's in the New Testament? Somebody had died. They said, well, master, don't, aren't we going to, you know, do our thing and go bury the person? And he said, you, you know what Jesus said? Let the dead go bury the dead. And he emphasized that God was a God of the living. He emphasized that. Do you know what people do when they're talking to loved ones that have passed? That's called necromancing. Do you know that God forbid anybody to ever try that? And do you know why? He gave an explanation, and that came by way of the prophets. When you start talking to the dead, you don't know what you're reaching. You don't know what you're talking to, and God forbade us from doing that. That is a dark practice. See, in today's world, they do it every single day. They do that forbidden thing. In fact, they're doing a lot of things God forbade mankind to do. And when he said, don't do it, let me tell you why he said, don't do it. Because your soul can be lost doing it. That's why. That's why he said, don't do it. And isn't it funny? Listen, I'm going to mention something because some of you are familiar with this. The same people who hunt ghosts will rebuke a demon in the name of Jesus, our precious Savior, and turn around and cuss like a sailor two seconds later. Haven't you noticed? I keep pace with a lot of things. I do. I keep pace with this world. I know what's happening in the world. I'm not one of those who will say, oh, that's too disgusting. I can't know anything about it because I've already been introduced to it from the backside coming to the front. I already know about it, and it does not move me. But I am hyper aware of what's evolving in the earth hyper aware the, the the books in the bible clearly state that in the last days things like that would happen it's very dangerous most things have become a ritual and they are teaching some of the ancient incantations rituals and rites rites that have long been forgotten rites that were meant for the resolving of curses by a curse. See, the fallen taught how to employ demonic entities and then how to bind those same demonic entities, how to bind them for servitude, how to utilize them. But this is how foolish mankind is. Man can only see in the realm of the living unless God give you sight in the spiritual realm. Remember the one prophet who could see in the spiritual realm. And he said, God, open up the eyes of this protege so he can see what's happening in the battlefield. And when he did, what did that guy see? 
What did he see? He saw battling angels all over the place. You're not by yourself. And sometimes, now I strongly believe, I'm a witness to this, the Lord will open people's eyes to the spiritual realm. I would never, if I were you guys, I would never ask for that. Don't ever ask for that. You cannot unsee what you have seen. And once you can see the spiritual realm, all of the spiritual realm can see you. And from that day forward, your life, you're never going to live it the same. They're going to hunt you like a dog. That means any crack in you, they're coming to exploit without hesitation. If you drift back into memory lane, you're going to be destroyed instantly. They will make your life living perdition is what they'll do. You don't want that. Accept what the Lord has given you and grow. And whatever he compliments by way of gifts, right, he'll do that in proportion to your maturity. But try not to seek mysterious things that you may not be able to handle. What the Lord has given you is sufficient. Don't ignore the task he's giving you at hand is what I'm saying. Some of you have a task with your own families. That's why you're in that family. See, you may not, you may not see it this way. Let me, let me go ahead and demonstrate something. That family you have with your children and, and your spouses, right? Do you not realize what they are? The bodies are children. The bodies are. The body may be female. The body may be male. But in the end, you're all, should all of you give your life to the Lord, all of you are joint heirs with Christ. You know what Jesus said? They had a conversation, and they said a man was married to five wives. Who's going to be his wife in heaven? And Jesus said, don't you know anything? You're not going to be male or female. You'd be like the angels. They're neither male nor female. You're not going to have a wife. You're not going to have a husband. That's what Jesus said. That's what he said. Now, I know people have dreams and experiences and everything else, and I can tell you, I can only tell you this by my own personal experiences, that the Lord will speak to us in very special ways. So we see a lot, but it's important that we take everything to the most time to see what he's saying to us. Right? I've also noticed something else. Anything he has ever given me to give to somebody else, God has already given it to them. And when I speak it, they'll say, you know, the Lord gave me that already. And I'll become confirmation only. That's all. I'll never speak anything new. Please keep that in mind so you don't get bedazzled into losing your soul chasing something. Because God has you here on this earth. He sent you here. But what happens to the individual who's neglecting everything here because they want to leave when well, what they're actually saying is no to the most high? If a person says, well, I can't take it anymore, that's a lie. Don't say that. God knows how much you can take. He knows what you can't take. And he already promised he would never put anything upon you more than you can bear. That means everything that's ever happened in our lives, we were able to take in the first place or would never happen. If anything transpires in our lives, we're strong enough to take. We just have to stop complaining. Because when we complain, it will limit the usage of spiritual gifts that you naturally have. You limit your own authority because you won't use it. Hmm. And this isn't the time to have a lack of spiritual authority or think you have a lack. The truth is you don't have a lack of spiritual authority. And I know that certain Catholics, I know your articles, right? I know, I know what people believe there. I know what people believe. But let me tell you something. The Lord has given you natural abilities that you have exercised already. You just didn't tell anybody. And they were subtle. But they were absolutely effective. There were times when you did not accept certain things, and that thing did not prosper. That's a natural spiritual authority. 
because you believe in Christ. The issue is there are elements in the world that would cause you to surrender your spiritual authority and bring you into agreement with dark forces. And you don't know they're dark forces. And when you agree with dark forces where two or three are gathered together, in his name there he is also, right? Right? That means the power of God is in the midst of us when we are gathered together in his name and nothing is withheld. So that means these gatherings, this is the place for healing. This is the place for repair. Because we're together in fellowship. That makes fellowship the power element in this earth. When we come together, now to come together does not mean all of us come together in one room. That's not coming together. Coming together is when you're of one mind, of one heart, one worship. That's what coming together is. You come together in all aspects. If we do that, nothing is withheld. You know, that happened one time here in COT, one time. And then division came in so swiftly, I mean swiftly, because it couldn't afford for that to happen again. Too bad for it. There is a method to remove that. It's just not been executed yet. The Lord has his timing. Could we evoke that? Of course we could. But I'll tell you, it's better to do things by the Lord's direction than to ever go on your own and do it yourselves, no matter what the reason is. It's better to do things by the Lord's direction. Because he knows what comes after and we do not. That means you can have a victory in one area and an absolute disaster in another. Right? It's kind of like if you go out to heal somebody, and you know they can be healed, and you evoke the authority of Christ by way of his name, the demons, whatever is causing the brokenness in that body, they're going to have to go. But the Lord gave a warning, didn't he? He said, if a demon leaves a body, it's going to go out and find dry places, which means it's not going back to hell. Sorry, it's not. It's not going to hell. It's going to go out and find dry places. It will come back to where it was kicked out from. And if it comes back and finds that place is swept clean, it's going to go back out and find seven worse than it is. And Jesus of Nazareth said that person's end condition is going to be worse than the first. Now, he gave us a method, insight into the spiritual realm, into what's actually happening. Not the, the, the wish hope scene, but the real scene. That these evil spirits are roaming the earth. This is their domain. They're, all, they're going to be here on this earth until the Lord does away with them during the judgment. That's why you're going to judge the angels by way of what they have caused upon the earth. Because you're living witnesses. You have to live in their mess. So you're qualified to do that. But if you go out there on your own casting out demons, and you don't have, you don't get that person to be filled with the spirit of the living God by way of his acceptance of Jesus on the cross, which means you're going to have to evangelize. You're going to have to stay with that person. You're going to have to walk that person through some things. You're going to have to point that person in some sure directions to have that person filled, or you could kill somebody out there. You could cast out demons, and then that person could literally, literally die from being swept clean because worse demons will come back into the person. That means the person is empty. If a person is empty, have, uh, let me give you guys a mystery. You won't read this anywhere. I'm telling you right now. Don't ask me where I got this from either. Don't Please don't ask because I'm not going to tell. But have you noticed it is a requirement that everybody on earth have faith in something? When you guys, and the, the, many of you were like this, when you were walking around empty, you know about the Lord, but you, didn't, you weren't serious in your walk yet, right? And so you considered many things. Doesn't mean you were in a cult or anything like that. That's not what it means. But you didn't actually have a firm belief in you. And so guess what happened? You had one of those extraordinary experiences. 
something came into your life that was not right. And it didn't just do it one time. It did it over a series of years. At the end of that, something clicked. And when it did click, that's when you became serious about the Lord. But see, you didn't even have the subject of such things in your mind until you had those experiences in your life. That happens for everybody. Because no one on this earth is going to walk this earth empty. Do you know that? Nobody. Don't ask me how I know. But there is some requirement. They're not going to walk the earth empty. They're not going to do it. It's not going to happen. Some people who had ministers as dads and stuff like that, right? They were moved in a specific way. Something happened. Something happened. So when a person is walking this earth and all they believe in is what they can see, guess what happens? They have an appointment they don't even know about. And it 100% is going to take place. They're going to have an appointment. Because by the end of it, what did the living God say? What did he say? It, we can see it in prophecy that the people of the world are going to know all about God. But you're going to have rotten people who have sided with Satan that will absolutely hate him. You will. But everybody will have experience with the true nature of this world. And what that is, when something comes into your life and it instills that idea that there are things that are real beyond what you can see, when that comes into your life, what happens? It wakes a part of you up. It makes a part of you aware that if it were not aware, the earth would be a playground. The earth would be a very different place. It's part of the stage of your progression. And another stage is coming. That was just so somebody has something in them. Another stage is coming. Another stage, a whole other stage. And when people have this stage, I'm going to tell you something. They're not going to say, I don't think there's a God. That's not what they're going to say. They're not going to say, well, I don't know about, you know, de I don't know about devils or demons. And that's not what they're going to say. They will either love the Lord or they will blaspheme the Lord. But there will be no in between. And that other stage is coming. And it's not coming in anybody's timing, and no one can forecast it. But it's coming for every single living soul on this planet. And when it's done, you won't be at this stage. Most people are halfway blind. You won't be at this stage. All the blindness will be over, and everyone will see. Everyone. Now, that doesn't mean everybody's going to accept, because at that time, should a person truly be dark, they will not side with the living God. They will step away from him. They will be against him wholeheartedly. Wholeheartedly. But those who are with him, nothing will be able to tear them away. These things are coming in your lifetimes. You're already in the hour of this transition. It's already there. That's why there's so much confusion and there's so much, well, let's just say there's an expediency to establish long-held plans with humanity. They are speeding up everything. They are speeding it up. They know because they're in contact with the darkness of this world. And they already know. They already had their warning. Things are happening quicker than people can perceive. That's why 
It is not a good idea to be here on this earth and you believe in the living God and yet in your heart you say, I don't want anything to do with this world. I want to go home because that's a direct rejection of why you're here in the first place. You're not here by yourselves. You're not. You were sent here. You're supposed to be here. But you also have a task. Your calling is real. Not all of you, but many of you, you were shown something. You were shown something. You were shown a suffering. And to this day, you, you really don't speak about that to anybody. You were shown yourself suffering. You saw yourself in a not-so-good position. And for some of you, it scared the peanuts out of your m and ms You saw it. You didn't share that with anybody because you didn't understand that. You didn't want that to be. Half of you, no doubt, rebuked it. The Lord is quite serious about what's happening all around you, just in case you haven't noticed. Why do you think these policies have been passed that are tearing the souls out of people. They're direct challenges to the soul right now by way of policy. But the world is quickly becoming a replicated Sodom and Gomorrah. The immoral nature of mankind is spreading even to places, even to places you'd never think it would spread. And do you guys, and let me share this with you because this is my instruction, but do you guys know what it is when a person sets themselves on fire? Does anybody know what that is? The truth of it, what that is? Anybody? Because you'll see it soon. And you're supposed to know that is symbolic. It's an act. It's an act of, I don't want to say higher forces, but spiritual forces. And they enact something in this physical realm for darkness itself. It is part of an incantation. And when that happens, the other stage of chaos is opened up all over the earth. Normally it's followed by legions of operatives, you could say. Major changes. Major. When you see this again, you see it again because the world will always see it. When you see it again, make sure that your houses are in order. That's the last call for your houses to be in order. Now, it doesn't mean the end of the world. That's not what it means. It means that the spiritual challenges are going to become all too real for everybody. That's what it means. Hmm? Or are we going to, somebody said the 144,000 are going to be untouched. They're going to be scared to death. Read about the 144. They have to be sealed because they're left here in this world. They're left. They're left. When a great many have gone, they're left here. They have to be sealed so that the power of the destroying angels will not destroy them with the earth, that the plagues won't be unleashed on them, and they are terrified. It says they are frightened at what they see. They'll be here when the bottomless pit is opened and men are tormented on the earth. They'll be here when all the green grass is burnt up. They'll be here when men are losing their lives all over the earth. And then they will be the ones that will actually sing. But you see, trillions of people have gone on to be with the Lord already. Do you know that? And where do they come from? If they believe in Christ, They've come out of great tribulation. I believe that happens over the span of time. That's what I believe. That number that no man can number, that doesn't happen all at one time. 
That happens over a span of time. See, I believe the word not so much metaphorically like people do. But I see God's revelation for interpretation of the word. I do. I do. I really do. Not that I have anything against anybody's theories. I just don't live my life by theories. I learned a long time ago never to do that when we can have the truth. But I've also learned that I'm not here to solve the word of God. No. I'm not here to solve it. Right? Somebody said, aren't the 44,000 the young Jewish men who are virgins? Well, in the Bible, it was translated, or, or not translated, but it was later told that the 144,000 are virgins. They were not corrupted by a woman. Right? That they would sing a new song unto the Lord because they were untouched by the iniquity of this world, the, the, the defilement that was happening in the world they were. And do you know, in, in the Middle East, they keep the original 12 tribes by way of the bloodlines and everything else. They have set aside that very thing. It's a, it's a very interesting thing. They've set aside that. They do that every single year. That if one gets up to a certain age, they're released back in society, and another one has taken its place, so they will always have that complete number. Always. Because they absolutely believe in that. But I'll tell you this. I can tell you right now, I'm not one of the 144,000. I am not. I'm not. It's just their versions, right? Now, that could be interpreted as many things, possibly. If, if you're a virgin by way of the body, of course, you're, you're not corrupted or defiled in that way. If you're a virgin by way of the spirit, right, then you have not been corrupted by society. In either case, you've been set aside, right, and you have not been defiled. I've been defiled. That's why I need Christ. For person, for person, to have not been defiled, right? No wonder they were sealed. See, I need Jesus Christ. That's who I need. I need him. Because I'm a sinner saved by grace. The 144,000 are a bit different. That's why they were the only ones that could sing a specific song. They were the only ones who could do that. Only 144,000. Ladies and gentlemen, there have been hundreds of trillions of people that have lived on the earth. And they are not one of the 144,000. That actually, that 144,000 is spoken about a few times. And it's also mentioned in other books. The reserved of the Lord. They're, they're, they're held aside from everything, right? And it, now I'll go ahead and share this. This is me. I'll share this with you. Ready? I dreamt something about 144,000, and guess what they were? Anybody know what they were? They were embryos. That's what they were. They were embryos. The 144,000 were embryos. They weren't even born yet. That was the odd part. They were embryos in this dream. Before I knew about the 144,000, I dreamt about those embryos. I dreamt about them. And I was a kid when I dreamt about that. Because I remember asking my mother about that. I was a child, and I didn't even know what an embryo was. You know, I just didn't. So anyway, that's, that's my story, right? So I'm never too quick to say, oh, yes, I'm one of the 144,000. No, I'm one of the sinners saved by grace, by Jesus Christ. I've already been defiled. I need the Savior. I'll never be in a position where I do not need the Savior. Right? I'm one of those, one of the ones who needed Jesus of Nazareth. I needed his blood to wash over me. That's who I need. I'm not one of the ones who are a virgin, who is not defiled by a woman. I'm not one of those. I'm a sinner saved by grace. I'm one of the ones who are right here right now attempting to fight the good fight of faith all the way to the end till I'm called home. No matter what the circumstances are, that's who I am. I'm committed to finishing it until the end. And God dictates when that end is, not me. I'm not the Rambo type. Oh, yes, I'm going to be when the beast comes and the guillotines will be here. I'm going to still be here. Nope, I never claimed that because I don't know. I don't know. I know a portion of what the Lord showed me. A portion. A portion. 
and it looked pretty desperate to me. But I've been in desperate times already. But I'm a sinner saved by grace. I'm not one of the virgins who are not defiled by a woman, the ones who will sing a new song, right? No, I'm one of the ones fighting tooth and nail right here for my fellow man. I'm one of the ones who said yes to the tasking given today. That's who I am. Right? Now, all of us follow as we believe. Right? You have to go with what the Lord, the Lord showed. I saw that when I was a kid, so that's very tough for me to deny. A lot of what I've seen, the Lord showed me before I ever got serious about him. It's just how it is. Right? Somebody said, uh, so, what, what, somebody's addicted? Hold on. Oh, 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 oh stop. Ah, there is. Somebody says, uh, somebody says there's so many people. So many people addicted to a cheap drug called crank, horse tranquilizers. I had to wonder what happens to them in their mind when they can't get it. Thoughts. Well, when they can't get it, it's going to be horrible. That's not the worst one. That's not the worst one. I, now, people aren't going to like me for this, but I'll, I'll give you the worst one. I'm going to give you a very bad one. Ready? What's going to happen when people can't get a hold of marijuana? Now, you didn't hear me say it was addictive, did you? But I'll tell you something. Anything that helps a person compensate from dealing with the world, when they don't get that compensation, they're not going to quite be themselves. That's also a mental compensation, an emotional compensation. An addiction is one thing, and it can cause the body to go through weird moments. It can actually cause a person to be debilitated to the point where they can't do anything, right? And they'll ask that, that that's obvious. But the ones who need the marijuana are keeping something down. So what happens when they never have it again? They can't keep that certain thing down again. I have seen people who don't, who can't, who couldn't get marijuana anymore in certain places of the world, and they got, they were mean. They were mean, mean. They were snappy, right? They would, they, they just could not handle the environment they were in, and that's a compensator, right? Suppose it's not addictive. Well, that's fine. But what I'm telling you is that anything you have to utilize emotionally to compensate for what you can't handle, because a lot of people are not facing things. They're just not, they're running away from things. They're not facing it, right? They haven't built up the proper mechanisms to deal with chaos itself. And when they can't get a hold of that, it's just not going to be, I, I'm going to hate to see that more than anything, and I'll tell you why. Because some people don't even know it's helping them compensate against containing their emotions. They don't know that. One of the things a person will lose without marijuana is the ability to handle their own emotions. They won't be able to handle their own emotional state. Right? For, for, for a woman, it will drop estrogen levels. And do you know what happens when a woman does not have estrogen? It doesn't matter what the, who the woman is, the body is going to go berserk. It will. That, has anybody ever felt that feeling of aggravation? You don't know what it is, ladies? It's just like an irritating feeling. You can't even explain it. You may ball your hands up. You want to scream or something like that. That's what happens when you have an estrogen drop, when it just falls out of the bottom. It's hard for the, the body no longer sends out certain... Uh, uh, chemical signals to maintain emotional responses and everything goes amok so the chaos comes from within right these are common things with the flesh unless a person can override their own flesh how are they going to deal with that how are they going to deal with it now i'll tell you this the lord has given us ample time right He's given all of us ample time the problem is we keep putting we're so good at putting everything off for tomorrow I'll get it tomorrow. It's not a big deal. We, that's what we say to ourselves. It's not a big deal. I'll get to it later. You know, it's not going to do anything, you know, because we always compensate things we enjoy. I don't know about you guys, but it's just like eating, right? 
I quit putting any seasoning in food. I ate a, uh, what did I eat the other day? I think it was a, um, it was a, a tangerine. I ate a tangerine and oh my goodness gracious, right? They, they weren't even sour. They weren't sweet either to the average person. To me, it tastes like two spoon, two big cups of sugar was poured in my mouth. I mean, it was that, it was that sweet. I can't even explain it. I can't, right? The smallest things, the things that are normally bland, they have too much flavor. Too much. It's like a flavor overload. I ate a piece of celery, and it was almost the same sweetness as a watermelon. A piece of celery. And it was a normal piece of celery. It's just that I haven't had seasoning in so long, right, that everything is is amplified. Things smell different. Everything is different, right? Because I know what's happening with the food. And if you guys aren't on to this yet, you know, there, there, there are going to be alterations. And what you eat is going to be enforced upon the populace to eat specific ways. And certain things will not be available. Your favorite items are not going to be available. And it's very bad to suffer with, with uh, when you start suffering because of food, that affects your pleasure centers in your body. Right? Doctors and nurses and people like that, they know about that. And that means you're going to go into a type of depression simply because you can't stop your, you know, those hunger pains are going to be uh, transmuted. The signals and your chemistry of the body will change almost through a tantrum because you don't have your favorite your little piece of food. And it can be tough. I've seen soldiers go through that, right? Somebody says, coffee, yes, coffee is going to give you a headache in the back of your head. If you're not careful, all you have to do with caffeine, all you have to do with these things that can like, like caffeine and even chocolates and sodas and things like that, trick the body. In other words, don't be consistently giving it to your body. Consistent means don't drink coffee every morning at eight o'clock. Don't do it. Make it sporadic. And when you do that, your body will stop its addiction to anything. An addiction is when your body expects it. Right When it does not get what it expects, it throws everything else off. So then do not give your body what it wants when it wants it. Stop the routines. Stop the routines. You'd be surprised how hard that is to do. But stop the routines. That's all you got to do. Those of you who are smoking, stop your routine first. Change it mentally. And I'm telling you, ask the Lord's help and things will change. You will not go through what you think you're going to go through. Those of you taking medication, do the same thing. Don't take medication for a social compensator. Don't do that. Don't save, but because I've heard people say it. Well, I got I to gotta take this before I go out around the people. And no, don't do that. And we're, we're talking about, um, you know, people who legitimately take medicine like that. Start altering that stuff. Start making the changes now. A lot of people say, well, I don't want to go cold turkey. Well, nobody asked you to go cold turkey, right? But surely from the time we started talking about this to this very day, it's been, what, nine, ten years. You could have come down quite a bit, right? You could decrease what you're doing every single day in a very safe way. God has given us time to do this stuff is what I'm trying to tell you. But the problem is we just simply won't do it. He's given us ample time. We just simply won't do it. Encourage each other. Help each other. Never force someone to do it. And don't do it for any other reason than a long-lasting, long-standing, eternal reason. Right? So that your reason never fails. I quit drinking soda, for example. I quit doing that because it was just, uh, it was just too many young folks who were picking up on that. I didn't do it for me. I did it for them. But now a soda is entirely too strong. It is. I mean, it has a kick like a horse. So I can't drink soda. I couldn't drink a soda if I tried. It's just too strong. Water is sufficient. And water tastes very different. Extremely different. But your body has that ability. Right? If you give your body too much, it's just going to want more. Your body is full of a lust mechanism. Whatever you give the body is going to want more and more the next time. Don't give it to, don't give into your body, right? Your chemistry will start to change. You'll notice differences. The Lord has given us time. 
And God knows we have to prepare for some things. Don't be frightened of what's coming. Prepare for what's coming. All right? Keep living your life, but prepare. It's very easy. It is. It's very easy. Never say it's difficult. Never say it's impossible. Never say it's hard. The Lord put you here. And if he put you here, everything that uh, we ever did to ourselves, he's also given us a way to undo that. So take advantage of it. It's called time. It's called time. Somebody says, what about us diabetics? Now, that's a longer conversation and one that I cannot have publicly, but I'll tell you this. You're, you're a lot of doctors, they do what they do. They prescribe medications because they get kickbacks from big pharma, right? That, that's a, a, a product of the world we live in. So what you have to do is you have to really... Listen, find out your own condition by way of your physician. Listen to me. Let him tell you what your condition is. And then don't take your condition to anybody else. Start praying about your condition. Tell the Lord what you want to do and be sincere about it. Now, that means you continue on your regimen. But let the Lord handle the big things. He can see inside your body. He can tell you the truth of what's going on, right? Trust what the Lord gives you. Whatever he gives you, he has the power to implement. That means don't do it on your own, right? Don't go out there and be Rambo. Oh, I can, because if you're taking medication, that means you have a lack of, you may have a lack of faith in that area of health. So in that case, thank God for the doctors. And I'm, what I'm telling you is start taking things before the Lord. And don't forget what you took before him. And begin to listen. Right to the good advice that's already been given to you concerning that, because not one person can deny, especially diabetics. People have given you good advice, but how many people know that uh, diabetics? And I'm not picking on diabetics, but they don't want to follow the good advice. They have things they say like, "Well, I've been doing this for years, right? Well, I've had it this way. I've been eating this food this way since I was a young one." Well, guess what? You overdid it, and your body can't take it anymore. So what you have to do is you have to seek the Lord, continue on your regimen, right? Right? And let the Lord guide you in your steps. Let the Lord guide you in your steps. He will not steer you in a wrong direction. He won't. You just can't trust all the motives of men. And it's not even to say your physician is crooked. That's not what I'm saying. Um, what? You really don't know who is who these days. You don't. You don't know why they do what they do sometimes, right? Take it to the Lord. These are days where the Lord answers. The Lord is setting people free from things. If they would just be sincere, that means go to the Lord and don't 10 days after, don't say, well, nothing happened. I tried having faith at nope, because that means you gave up. Let the Lord have his way in your life. So let me give you one more piece of insight. Often your condition can be somebody else's breakthrough. Let me give you the, let me give you how this is. Some of you are sick out there, right? And you don't know why you're sick. You're tired of being sick. Make sure you can hear me on this. Especially if you're tired of being sick, right? If, if you just, you just want to, you want to be well again, right? Listen to me. What would happen to a person? If they saw you sick every single day, but they also saw you pray every day, and they also noticed you never gave up on Christ, you stayed faithful, and they really took notice of this, right? If they know you're sick, they can see other things about you, which means they can see your pain levels, they can see you complain, they can see you when you're not complaining, they can see trusting your face or no trusting your face. But what happens if they saw you never giving up on Christ? I'll tell you what would happen. One day, the Lord would heal you, and that person would see. And in that very moment, that person would have the greatest breakthrough in their lives. By your healing, let me tell you how. Because they would have watched you go through all sorts of hell on earth, but you never gave up on your faith in Christ. And the day you're healed is the day they're going to fall to their knees and say, that's 
the Jesus I want in my life. That's what I can trust. See, in that moment, you'll be a demonstration of the power of the living God in the earth to unsuspecting people, because you don't know they're really watching you like that, but you will be the breakthrough they were looking for. Do you not know, just like you all, just like many of you said, Lord, if you just show me one thing, I'll know it's you. Just like you had that on your heart, so do they. But whom, who can the Lord send who would suffer all this stuff on the earth? And people would know that they would suffer, right? One who's not going to sit there and lie and say, oh, no, nothing is wrong with me. I'm okay. Nope. The person who would suffer things but never give up on the Lord, still continue in his ways to everybody else is going to look like it's a losing battle. Right, But they would stay with the Lord, and then one day he would heal them in view of all of them. They would see it so they can have their breakthrough. Who would put up with that? Who? Who? Who could he send? Who could he send to do that? Because half of you are in the position, which means he may have sent some of you. But are you ready to give up? Are you not willing to go through the whole thing for their sakes? Are you not willing to be used as an instrument of the Most High? You know when the Lord said, many are called, but few were chosen? I believe it's because most of our lives are set up that way. And when we give up, we can't be used that way anymore. Don't give up. Don't give up. See, I know that from experience. I know what happens when a person can see your life go straight downhill and the Lord puts you back on your feet. And the very thing they remember is that you never gave up on Christ. Nobody had to tell me that one. I know that one. I know what happens. I know what happens. But who will the Lord send to do that? Who of you would endure all things for a true move of the living God? See, everybody wants a move of the living God, but they want the fabulous time. Who wants the real time where people see you as the example, where you become that person in the story that struggled, that looked like they were going to fail? And then at the end of the movie, when everybody counted that one out, He becomes the last one left and everybody applauds and people are crying because the very one they thought would fail, somehow, he made it through. Did that make a good movie? Hmm? Your life is just like that. You know where you find out the proof of that at? In your word, in the Bible. It's there. That's what you're set up for. But I'll say it again. The Lord said, whom shall I send? No wonder he said, he that endures until the end, the same shall be saved. You are called. You have a very high calling. But if you listen to the world, they're going to make you think being called means having a fabulous life. Living in a mansion, wearing white clothing all day. When God calls a person, and many are called, it's for a real work. It's for a supernatural work. And is that not supernatural? To see a person like that who you thought would not make it. And that because you saw their healing, it moves you to the point where you fall on your knees and desire whatever that person has. People are looking for that these days. There are lots of people struggling. They're looking for a savior. What examples do they have? The Lord has always been moving. We just have to be careful of where we're getting our truth from. I would encourage all of you to get your truth from the living God. 
because the world does not have the truth. Please remember that. Now, I don't know how I got so far off the subject. Yeah, I do. I do. I do. Anyway. Anyway, guys, listen. Let me tell you guys this before I go. Before I go. This first upload is about to happen to the site. When you guys are reading this, now put a small disclosure up there, right? But let me give you a verbal disclosure. I'm not proving anything to anybody. It's not why I'm doing this. I'm doing this to assist anybody who may find themselves in certain conditions that they may be, they may have knowledge of things that can actually help them. Certainly to help them maintain, right? I'm not talking about subjects to fascinate anybody. This is for actual assistance. This is to help those who would find themselves in specific areas and circumstances. This world we live in looks one way with the eye, right? But that's because the majority of it is closed off. It, it really is closed off. I do encourage everybody, as you go through these KD files, which are by way of personal experiences, from more than just me, the sources are within those who have gone through it, that you have your word right beside it. Always do that. That's the purpose of it. Because, see, things are coming. People are going to learn about things, and there's no context for it. But the truth is, there's been long-standing context for things that are happening. It's just that they, they can't be seen. For example, how can you see at the floor of the ocean and what's under the floor of the ocean? You can't. The average person can't see that. This argument about space, the, uh, something as simple as the moon landings, why would that be significant or oh, it's very significant? But a lot of people don't believe there's moon landings. Because they never knew that for every mission is a duality. Everything they do up there, right, they have set up to do down here too. Did you know that? Down here on Earth is the simulation. Up there is the real deal. So they do both at the same time and both are filmed. That's the truth. That's how it works. But the moon will be uncovered. Its mask is going to be removed. And when that happens, there will be death on this planet. The bottomless pit is more expansive than you think, and those who dwell in the oceans are not your buddies. And they're not going to care what a person believes. They're not. But people are being primed to be usurped by way of the soul. They are. It's going to weaken their faith in Christ. Different narratives are coming. Large people who can demonstrate powers you've never seen before. They're going to bedazzle the average individual. They're going to show them things that's going to warp their minds. And while the Good Christian is trying to have faith. They're going to be something near to some small G demigods on earth. Exercising things you never thought you would see. You think people are prepared for that? Hmm? Do you guys remember on Pastor Paul's show when I was talking about the Orcas? Do you guys remember that? Anybody remember that? Anybody? Remember I was talking about the Orcas? They kept popping up outside of Portugal. You guys don't remember that? That's funny. That's funny, isn't it? Not too many people remember that. That those whales are warning people. Then they had the earthquake and those people died. Listen, that was in Morocco, right? Do you not know that that's where the whales kept popping up? Right there outside of Morocco. 
They're warning people. But some people listened to that. They did. They didn't go through that earthquake. We have people in COT from that area, but I told them, don't, 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 don't say anything about it here. That's for people to either hear or not hear. You know what the sad part is? You're listening to me now, aren't you? Those orcas are going to warn again. Do you know why? Because people are about to burn. But who's going to listen? Who? Who's going to listen to that? They're not going to listen to that. They won't listen to it, will they? They're not going to listen to that. It's going to happen. The world's going to say, oh, how bad, you know, that is. That's a tragedy. They're not going to listen to a thing. They won't. Maybe a few, maybe. But they're not going to listen. It's going to be like no one ever said anything about it. And it will continue to be that way. My point is, most people are trying to hear what they want to hear and their ears are not open to take in anything. They're looking for some confirmation of what they have already have in their heads. And if people can, people are going to continue to do that. But by doing that, they blind themselves to the many things happening already. It's almost like they can't see what's right in front of them. Why? Because they're looking for something specific. If you lost your phone or your house, you know what happens? You start bypassing everything else. And because you're so focused on the phone, you start finding things that you'd been looking for weeks before. You, oh, there that thing is, right? But, but it's in the way, so you just throw it to the side. And you find something else, and but you throw that to the side. And you find something else and you throw that, but the, then you find your phone. And then it's not a day later, you'll say, wait a minute, I was looking for the phone and I found that thing, but I don't know where it was. And do you not know we do this almost on a continuous basis? We do. Somehow we've got to learn to start seeing things and hearing things, not just what we want to hear, but just to hear it. If you hear something by way of the spirit, though, if it rings true in the spirit, and you're not fighting it, it'll serve you well. Because if it's of the spirit, the spirit of truth, that is, it's going to be bound in that realm of truth. It'll be helpful information. Helpful. That's what the KD files are. It's for helpful information, not just noise, not just a story, not just to follow some narrative somebody set in the world. I'm not, because I'm not talking about things people are talking about in the world. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not augmenting anybody's subject. This is to assist people in some very real things you're going to be tied up in the middle of. Things that people go through, you'd be shocked. You'd really be shocked at how much has happened already. Some of the true stories behind the stories. You would be sickened. The motivations people have to do what they do. And how quick they are to change everything for the dollar. You'd be shocked. And there will come a time where you won't be able to help anybody. That time is coming soon. Congress, they get sat phones. You guys heard about it. People reported on that. Christian people reported on that. I don't think anybody really regarded that. I don't think they did. I think they know about it, and that's it. And that's it. I, that should give people a hint. If they have sat phones, and they issued that, that became public knowledge. I think that should, you know, really let you know something. People won't listen. We're not going to listen. And again, when the people burn, where the orcas are warning, they're warning, maybe it's almost like God's creatures are warning people. They're trying to get people's attention, but people are not listening. They're not listening. They will not listen. That earthquake in Morocco, that was only a warning. Yes, it costs lives because the burn is going to be bad. 
But again, it's going to be like it's non-existent news. Because things like that aren't supposed to happen, right? The Lord has given plenty of warnings. But who's listening? Because people are in the habit of looking for the next greatest thing. Remember the Turkey earthquake? That was for a reason. It's almost like nobody's listening. They will wish they had very soon. And if you're alive hearing my voice, that means very soon for you. That's what that means. And once things begin, nothing is going to slow them down. Nothing. Hmm. Nothing. But, so we have been duly informed. Hmm. Somebody says something about the Mexican aliens. Oh, yeah, I saw that. Mexico has a lot of artifacts. You guys know that? Lots. Some different than others, right? If you ever hear about the uh, volcano people in Mexico, pay attention. Nobody can get around them. You know why? You, you have to stay about a 30-foot radius from these things because they are hot and they smell like sulfur and burning metal. Is it living or not? I don't know. But if they start talking about that or if those things start appearing, right? Take that one seriously. And you heard that, right? I said lava people. They start talking about lava people. Take that serious. People have already died from those things. You go, uh, you get closer than 30 feet and you're going to turn into dust. It won't be pretty. Right? That never ends well for anybody. In fact, that's a, that's a known terror. Even among governments, you start hearing about that, take that serious. Just stay out of the way. Best thing to do. Folks, listen, I'm going to go. I'm going to see you guys tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow and talk to Pastor Paul tomorrow. I guess if, if he's there, if everything is still good because he's always on the go. God bless his soul. But guys, listen, it's always a good time to have fellowship. I hope I imparted something useful tonight. I do. I do. And I hope you guys are aware. We're in times of instability, yes. But listen, God's grace is sufficient. It really is. So please try not to take it for granted. Try not. Try not to. He made all these accommodations, right, for us to be here at this moment. So remember, all of us have a task. That's why we're here. If we can remember that, right, we won't waste the days that God so graciously gives. We won't. Make them mean something. Right? Make them and assist each other, too. I'll certainly do my part. I'll do my part. Folks, I'll see you next time right here at the Council of Time. And I gotta get working back on the news page. I do. I had to fix a wall, though, and some wires. But uh, we're going to go now. So I'm going to get back to the... Uh, New stuff in the KD files on good stuff in the site. God bless you guys. I'm going to see you next time right here at the Council of Time. God bless.